hello everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today on this, I would say slightly gray Thursday in Edinburgh, at least that's where I am. Um, apologies for any beats in the background. Um, I am Katie, my pronouns are she, her. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Staff Bride Network here at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and I'm really pleased to welcome you all to today's Buy Plus Visibility event. Um, as you can see, I'm representing my bias today. Um, I'm here in my home office wearing my Staff Pride Network Buy Plus um, t-shirt, um, my Staff Pride Network lanyard and my fabulous uh, Buy flag in the background here for anyone that needs a visual description. Uh, I am a, a white woman in my early 30s wearing brown glasses and my hair looks brown at the top and I've got sort of slightly blonde at the ends. And um, it's really great to have so many people here today, and I'm looking really looking forward to the discussion. Uh, our events at the Staff Pride Network are open to all our members, um, as well as friends of the network. And we're also really pleased today to be co-chairing or co-hosting this event uh, alongside Pride Sock. Um, and I'd like to hand over briefly to Ida uh, for to get to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves as well and tell you all a little bit about Pride Sock. Thanks, Katie. So um, I'm Ida. I'm this year's president of Pride Sock, which is the university's LGBTQ plus society, open to all students and also non-students if they'd like to join. And um, so yeah, we this year we're doing a mixture of online and in-person events. We have regular events on Tuesdays and then also some um, extra events outside of our normal schedule. And so for example, um, tomorrow afternoon, actually, we're having a picnic in the meadows, which everyone is welcome to join um, at 3 p.m. And then next Tuesday, we are having a game night in the evening, uh, which is going to be online. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm very happy to be co-hosting with the Staff Pride Network tonight. And um, yeah, if anyone wants more information about the society, our membership is free this year. And yeah, we welcome everyone to join and yeah, just get in touch or check out our social media if you'd like more information. And yeah, I'll, I'm looking forward to the discussion and I'll hand over back to Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Ida. That's great, really um, exciting events that you've got lined up as well. Um, and thank you so much for being here as well. We really proud and the Staff Pride Network of our close connections with the student societies and, and different student initiatives. Um, while we are primarily a network for staff at the university, we have many members who are also PhD students who bridge that gap between staff and students. So really encourage you to get involved with the different opportunities um, and ways to make community within the LGBT plus community here at the university um, and in the city more broadly. Um, so today's event um, on um, being visible in a digital world um, will be uh, hosted by two of our fantastic volunteers in the Staff Pride Network. Um, they both sit on our committee. Um, um, they are Zara and Sarah, um, which I had to clarify on pronunciation there uh, before we started. Um, I'm going to hand you over to their very capable hands for the rest of the event, um, but if you do have any questions about the Staff Pride Network, please feel free to get in touch with any of the organisers. Um, by way of a reminder, you can, if you need it, have a live transcript of, of the event today if you press the live transcript button on Zoom. Um, you can use the Q&A function to ask questions, um, and if you want, you can also raise your hand. Uh, and you can send chat messages to the uh, speakers and panelists throughout the event. Um, and please follow our social medias um, and get in touch um, offline if you prefer to do that as well. Thank you so much for being here and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. And I will hand over now to Zara and Sarah. Hi everyone, uh, it's really great to be here. Um, I'm Zara and uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am the BAME rep for the Staff Pride Network. And um, I'm a PhD student during my day job um, looking at human genetics. Um, so if my co-host Sarah would like to introduce themselves. 
Uh, hi everyone, um, my name is Sarah Barnard, my pronouns are she, her, or they, them, um, and I am one of the social and events officers on the Staff Pride Network. Um, in my day job, I am an administrator at Edinburgh College of Art, um, and I am a proud bisexual, as I'm sure many of us here are, uh, or many of us might identify under the bi plus umbrella, and I'm sure we'll get to dig in a little bit about that um, as part of uh, this evening's discussions. Um, yeah, so we're very excited to welcome you all um, and looking forward to talking about being bi on the internet. <laughs> and to gather on the internet to do so. Um, how are we going to go about uh, introducing our panellists, Zara? Would you like to split it or what, 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 what should we do? So I can, I can go ahead and start. Um, so our first panellist is uh, Vanit. Um, his pronouns are he, him. Um, he is a, a writer and the creator of um, the hashtag bisexual men exist. Um, so it would be great if Venit could take a moment to introduce himself. Hi everyone. Yeah, so my name is Venit Metta. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I was born and raised in South and West London and I work as a software engineer in my day job. But in my spare time, I do a lot of work within the LGBTQ plus community. So I, um, sorry, so I, um, volunteered for Rainbow Films and we made a documentary around queer people of colour called Pride and Protest. I also volunteer for Middlesex Pride and the first Pride will be on Sunday. Um, I am an avid writer so my writing has been featured on Stonewall and Metro UK as well as a bisexual anthology called the Bible New Testimonials. I'm currently writing a book on bisexual men and co-editing an anthology on bisexual, uh, bisexual voices I do a lot of panels and talks on bisexuality and intersectionality. Uh, and like you mentioned, I created the hashtag Bisexual Men Exists, um, which trended to number one in the UK last year and also trended worldwide. Um, and I also made these shirts out of it, which raise money for bi organizations. We love to hear it. Welcome, Vinny. Um, our Thank second panelist. <laughs> Our second panellist is Rebecca Boyterska, uh, and I will invite her to introduce herself. Um, yeah, welcome, Rebecca. Uh, let's hear a little bit more about you and why exactly you are here with us this evening. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, just a quick visual description. I am a white woman in my early 30s. I have long red hair and um, black glasses, and I'm wearing like a grey-ish kind of top. So um, yes, I'm Rebecca Wojterska, my pronouns are she, her, and I have quite a few jobs. Um, one is I work at Edinburgh University Library, um, I manage a journal and book hosting service, and I also run my own publishing company in my spare time called Haunt Publishing, and um, that is for gothic, horror and dark fiction. Um, I, like Vinny, am also a writer, and also like Vinny, we are um, colleagues, shall we say. <laughs> um, we were published in the same anthology published by Montrose Regiment. And that was an anthology of um, writing about, you know, bisexuality. So um, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Fab, thank you so much, Rebecca, for being here and for introducing yourself. Um, our is Lorna Ward. Um, her pronouns are she, her, and if she could come and introduce herself, that'd be fab. Hi, my name is Lorna, my pronouns are she, her, and I am chair of the Scottish Bi Plus Network, an organisation that provides support for bi people in Scotland, as well as those who are questioning their attraction to multiple genders. Um, we've run a lot through lockdown. Um, and um, we've launched recently launched our neurodiverse space as well to support, provide extra support for those people. Um, and I guess we're most famous for running our bi gatherings that we ran every three months throughout lockdown, <laughs> um, which actually got people from all over the world to come and join us, which is a rare treat because not many people come and visit Scotland. Perfect. 
Well, thank you very much for joining us this evening, Lorna. Um, and it's great to hear about all the great works that you've been doing and that the the like the global bisexual vibes are already strong. I'm already loving it. Um, and in fact, that's a very kind of appropriate sort of note to begin on, I think. Um, I will just um, just give you a, a little bit of a of a recap of what the um, what we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, so we are discussing kind of by by plus visibility online in the wake of the in the wake of the pandemic and the isolation that's caused how has by by plus visibility goodness how has it progressed via social media and other online spaces uh, since early 2020 and um, we're going to celebrate our by plus identities discuss what online communication has achieved for our community and uh, consider steps that we still need to take to address by erasure and by phobia both online and offline and I suppose actually really I should have uh, begun by um, asking everybody to give our panelists a round of applause um, which we won't be able to hear but we'll be able to feel I think so <laughs> excellent <laughs> I could feel it thanks everyone <laughs> um, okay unless I've forgotten anything Zara so we should we dive into our first question that sounds fab so um we uh, we have a few things we want to talk about, but um, one of the first um, and kind of an introduction uh, to the whole discussion is um, we were wondering what uh, owning your bi plus identity online looks like to you personally and kind of how do you go about that in online spaces specifically. I'm happy to jump in and, and start. Um, so I think generally kind of being empowered and kind of confident in sharing as much or as little as you want to, um, because then you can tailor your kind of online experiences um, to yourself. Um, for me, being like really specific, because I run a uh, publishing company that publishes, as I said, gothic kind of dark uh, fiction and horror, um, we don't publish books about bisexuality, but I think it's important for me to make it clear that we're a bi-led company because I don't want to not be visible in these realms where you sometimes don't have that visibility. Um, so I try to be really kind of um, active in, in that sense and retweet certain things or engage in certain events such as, you know, even this one. Um, so I think for me, just that and I always try to ensure my books have um you know representation across the board not just not just by plus um so and with publishing being so um present on social media as one of the main ways of engaging with your readers and really creating a community in a way that's the perfect place for me to to be visible and to feel kind of confident in doing so um and every so often I might lose a few followers is when I when I post something but I'm like well I don't think you're the right followers for for me so um so yeah I'd say that for me for me um I I would say it's very similar I think it's just about being very loud <laughs> it's kind of what I do I just talk about it a lot um you know I write about it a lot I put it into a lot of the stuff that I do um, I, yeah, I just share information, you know, when, when people are saying something discriminatory, I share something and go actually, and I break it down and explain what bisexuality is and what it means and how they're completely misunderstanding the idea. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I think it's just being very loud and very visible and talking about it a lot and helping other people as well. I think, you know, when I created the, the hashtag, so much of it was about trying to create a positive movement when there was uh, entering a moment where there was so much biphobia mainly targeted towards men and just reminding people that bisexual men are out here and we exist. Not necessarily to help bigots um, to explain to them what we are, but like to help other bisexual men who are seeing this and are being hurt by it, just be like, hey, look, we're all out here, we're doing great. Um, and it really helps form that sort of sense of community as well you find other people, you connect with other people. It's how I've gained so many bisexual male followers in a way that I just didn't have any before. So um, yeah, it's just being loud and visible, you know? For 
for me, I don't really use social media that much. <laughs> I hide behind the Scottish Buy Plus network social media more. Um, my personal ones are probably mostly used just to retweet and like reshare stuff from there. Um, but at the same time, everyone recognizes me as part of the Scottish Buy Plus network. Um, it's, I think, been interesting because actually, I thought when I came out, more people would be funny about it. And actually, none of my extended family have, none of my friends have, or if they have, they've just like silently unfollowed and left my life, and that's fine. <laughs> um, so it's becoming a lot more common. Um, as someone who came through school through Section 28 and things like that, it's a very different world now. It strikes me that you all kind of like, especially uh, Rebecca, you were talking about being like the head of your publishing company and uh, how important it is that it's a bi-led company. And you're all kind of like leaders in leadership positions in like your own communities, which makes you, I would say, especially qualified. Oh, first of all, if any of you would like to comment about bi leadership and what that looks like, I'd be interested. Um, but also more generally, how has the has the bi community, the bi plus online community changed in the last 18 months? So sorry, that was two questions for the price of one. Um, and I will invite Vinit to speak first, if that's OK, just so we don't be overly polite. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I think what has happened in the last 18 months is that it has given people op more opportunity to connect. I think what uh, Lorna was saying earlier about getting people across the world, I feel like that's obviously a lot harder when you're focused on physical events. And I also think that there's, it makes it a lot easier to organize at the same time because I think when you're trying to do stuff in person, it's not just logistics of doing it in person, but it's also cost. And I feel like bike community is so often so underfunded. It's so grassroots led that having that ability to just be like, I'm just going to set up a Zoom and like, it's simple as that, um, ends up making it a lot easier for people to create just like random spontaneous gatherings. We saw that a lot during like the early stages of lockdown with sort of house party and Netflix party and Zoom calls and Zoom parties and all of that. And I think there is a, there's a level of like Zoom fatigue at the moment, but I think it did give a lot of people an opportunity to connect a lot more and find communities and find spaces because everything was online. So you didn't have to look outside. You were in your house all the time. You're on your computer a lot of the time. And it's like, well, let's find out what's out there. And it's, it's helped a lot of people to connect. I think. Those are some really interesting points. Um, I think, yeah, I agree with you there that the ease of um, communication has really kind of improved these spontaneous gatherings and stuff. Um, Rebecca, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I completely wholeheartedly agree. I feel like it's grown over the past 18 months. Um, and I think people are feeling more empowered to um kind of be out there and talk about it and you've got people like Vanit and Lorna doing these amazing work you know just such good work and you've also got people who um are just being visible in their day-to-day -day lives regardless of whether it's to do with promoting you know awareness about uh by plus visibility so I think that kind of spectrum of visibility is like really important um and yeah, I think what Vanit was saying about the community with Zoom and everything, you're able to connect with people all over the country, you know, all over the UK, all over the world, and meet all these people that you wouldn't necessarily meet. And I think that's created like a really strong community. Or for me, it, it's felt like really kind of heartwarming in a way. And um, yeah, just in a way that we didn't have these things before. And it can sometimes feel a bit insular. Um, so, yeah, completely agree with me. 
And Lorna, can you tell us about the um, hopefully expansion of the Scottish Biplus Network in the past 18 months? If it's just like dwindled and that's, don't tell us. <laughs> and I also wonder if you have any comment on um, Vinit's point about the Biplus community and uh, being very grassroots and uh, underfunded. I feel like you might have some thoughts on that. <laughs> Many. <laughs> um, we started as a really small grassroots hands in your pockets type organization. So everything that we needed was paid by someone, one of the activists. And we've been very, very lucky this year to get funding. We got two separate funding grants right as the pandemic and lockdown started. Um, and it's been interesting because we weren't actually sure initially how many people would show up online. Um, we used to run online meets before the pandemic for those who weren't fully out or for accessibility reasons couldn't travel. And they were attended by like eight people. So it was nice and it was small. And we've now got approximately 100 people on our Discord server who just randomly drop in to chat um, and like play games. And it's expanded so much more. And we've had a lot of people saying actually they need the online stuff to stay because even though they could make the odd in-person event, having that there pretty much 24 seven is something you can't really get anywhere else. That's even if we did have like a Bi Plus community center somewhere in the UK, a lot of people would be unable to travel to it. <laughs> so it's a sort of virtual community cafe of sorts. And we've run online events and they've had more people than we've had for in-person one day events. And it's enabled people like by plus Toronto to come, even though the time zones are awful and I appreciate them getting up either very early or very late. <laughs> and the same way we had Robin Knox deliver a session at one of our gatherings, which we could never have done if we'd had to fly them over from Boston to Scotland. But the fact that they, they woke up early, they woke up at 7 a.m. to come deliver a panel for us and it was amazing um but again it just wouldn't have been possible if we'd had to deal with real life logistics um <laughs> real life money <laughs> um, like that's a really important point like the amount of opportunities and the way i've been able to do more and more stuff because of the pandemic i don't want to thank the pandemic because there's a lot of bad stuff obviously but it's meant that I've been able to deliver talks and attend panels and do stuff because I can work it around my day job in a way I definitely wouldn't have been able to do before because I'd have to take a day off work and travel all the way to an office. So yeah, that's, that's interesting as well. And it has been great just to give people even a chance, even if you're not out, Discord being text-based, people can very discreetly chat with other Body Plus people without having to be out at home and things like that. It's a very stealthy way to stay in touch with the community. And I'm not saying you couldn't do it before, you know, like, oh, I'm off to meet some friends and then nip up to the local cafe and go to your Bi Plus group. But it's just a lot easier for people to access it and when it's convenient for them. Fantastic. I love the the idea of a, a virtual by community centre. That's such a lovely, a lovely image. And I'm really glad that that exists. Um, and that kind of brings us on to our next question, which is basically everyone's opportunity to plug their things, um, which is where can we find uh, by plus spaces online? Um, so maybe the things that you're involved in, but also if you know of any others, that would be really interesting for, for everyone to hear about. Why don't we mix things up a bit? Uh, Lorna, do you want to go first on that one, on the theme of bi community centres? Yes. So we're running a huge event this weekend called Bitastic. Normally it's a one day in-person event because it's online. It's spread out over four days. So it's our biggest event ever. <laughs> It starts tonight at 7 p.m. and runs all the way to 9 p.m. on Sunday. There's something for everyone and I will put the link in the chat. <laughs> and obviously we also have a Discord server. If you sign up for Bytastic, you will also get access to the Discord server. So you can drop in whenever you like to come and say hi to us all. Um, so I'm not in charge of running anything, but I do know that um, there's a lot of places that are doing online meetups. 
um, you, if you go and buy community news, it's normally a good place to find like your local buy area, buy group. And so much of them are doing a mixture of sort of online and in person as we're getting, I, I would say out of the pandemic, but I don't think that's the right word. Um, but some, some of them are starting to move to get more and more in-person stuff now that things are sort of opening up. Um, but they're also still doing online stuff. Um, so I know sort of L London Bisexual Meetup is doing online stuff. I know the, the Nottingham Bi Bitopia group is doing online stuff. Um, and so I think it's, if you go on there, you can find your local group, find whatever their socials are and contact them and you'll find they post stuff and find out what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's probably where I would recommend going. Um, I know Meetup, uh, the website is, can be quite useful as well. Um, and honestly, just Twitter, if you connect with people, you find more people and more people, and then you find stuff that they're doing, and you're like, oh, go on, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree as well. Um, so, like, obviously, I'm coming at this from, like, a kind of book nerd publishing kind of perspective. Um, so I'd recommend, um, yeah, like, Twitter can be your best friend, like, you know, hashtags such as the one that Vineet created, I would have recommended following the Scotch Buy Network and Lorna's here to recommend it herself. <laughs> um, Monstrous Regiment Publishing based in Leith and they publish, um, it's by led as well, and they publish anthology, it's about bisexuality, which is amazing. Um, I recommend Lighthouse Books, which I know many people will know. Um, a very safe space for bi plus people and indeed all uh, queer people. Um, and yeah, they'll be ensuring everything is, they always ensure everything's accessible and they'll be doing it, um, keeping digital events. Um, they had a launch in the garden, which I went to, which was just amazing. Um, from a spooky Gothic perspective, um, obviously haunt publishing, but um, I would also recommend Nyx Publishing, NYX. They're based in Sheffield and um, they publish queer gothic books and recently published one with a bi protagonist, which was very exciting. So um, I know they're not so much spaces, more amazing people and communities, but um, that's, yeah, they're my go-tos. Uh, if you do want a fun online event as well, there's uh, Middlesex Pride on Sunday, which I mentioned earlier. Um, it's more based around, so Middlesex is an area in West London which is very heavily dominated by sort of South Asian people and black people and Eastern European people. But if you're interested in that, it is also by led. I volunteered for it as well. Um, but the person who runs it is a bisexual South Asian woman. So feel free to tune in on that as well. <laughs> so fabulous. And I will definitely be checking out a lot of these spaces. Um, appreciate the plug for Lighthouse because it is perhaps my favorite place in Edinburgh. Um, so we love that. Um, I was just wondering whether we could dwell a little bit more on the idea of um, kind of maintaining online spaces. Um, I saw in the chat, uh, we got a message from um, Bobby. I won't read the whole thing, but the um, the idea is about kind of, um, especially older bi plus people um, feeling like they prefer the online events because it's kind of easier to attend, it's more accessible, it's cheaper in a lot of cases. Um, so how do you think now that things are opening up? So this is a slightly spontaneous question, but I'd love to hear some thoughts on it. Um, I was wondering whether you had any opinions on now that things are opening up a little bit more, whether like how we can try and maintain some of these like really accessible, really like international um, online spaces as in-person things are starting again. Can I tag on to that question as well and put on my learning and teaching admin hat and <laughs> ask um, what do we think like a hybrid approach to events like is there any way we could like I can't think of the word I want but like interweave the in-person and online events or do they have to be completely separate can we do we have capacity to run both like tell me all of your thoughts please um so I'll chip in um I think hybrid is very much going to be kind of the way forward for events because I've been I've seen events that have been live streamed uh, where I've not been able to get into the venue itself and that's been great. I've also seen Zoom events online, which has worked really well. Um, 
and I've been, as I mentioned, you know, to a garden for a book launch, which was lovely. So I think hybrid where there are multiple options, not just one. Um, I think that is the way forward. And I would like to um, mention a guide that has just been published um, called, I believe it's called Inclusion, like Inclusion, love a good pun, of course. Um, and that is just being, um, they're looking for funding for it right now. And they've launched it today. And that is a accessibility guide for um, future events, specifically in the literature sector. Um, so I, I had a look today, it looks amazing. And I really think um, we could all benefit from uh, listening and, and reading that. And I'll certainly be uh, going through and applying it to future events that I launch with Haunt. Um, but yeah, I'm very on the hybrid the hybrid fence that's not a thing is it <laughs> i'm on team hybrid there we go yeah i i think i i would agree i think um you know uh by pride is a good example i think this year they were planning on doing um, an online and in-person event they end up cancelling the in-person one but what they've said for next year is that doing an in-person event that will be streamed online um i'm not quite sure how they're going to do it but they did just get a huge chunk of funding and I think that is the really important thing to mention is that I think it's important to have both. And I think we should have online spaces and in-person spaces, but regardless of what you have, you need funding. And without the funding, because so many of these, I know so many communities where it's one or two people running it all by themselves uh, in their spare time, outside of their day job, and they can't do all of the stuff unless they have volunteers or resources or money to be able to pay people to do it, to help them out um, and to buy whatever they need to make it work. Um, and so I think that's the really important part is that I think we definitely need to go team hybrid. I think there's always going to be a demand for online events and always gonna be demand for in-person events. Um, and if we can stream the in-person ones online as well, that's great, but we do need the money. So we've been talking about like next year, what will Bytastic look like? And we want it to be a hybrid event, but we're aware that you're balancing sort of accessibility versus privacy. So for things like safe space, we wouldn't want to stream that. So we'd have to have a duplicate safe space online, whereas panels, talks, uh, performers, they're very easy to stream because you're it's just the person or people that have agreed to it but the second you've got sort of social spaces it's about doubling up and then it's back to what then he was saying about you need extra people to do that you need the money to do that um whether you can especially if you want to run them at the same time you basically double your volunteer needs I'm not saying it's not possible we've decided going forward we're going to try and commit to having at least one virtual event for every in-person event. So there's always options, even though we're aware for some things like film screenings, we might not get the rights to show the same film online. It might have to be a different film because that's a, <laughs> a whole issue in its own, but there are ways to do it. Um, and as I said before, we have had a lot of people saying that they really appreciate online events. For a variety of reasons not just accessibility but also being able to go to more than they ever could if you had to travel and arrange childcare and things like that that's great to hear and i think i i assume that intersectionality is like quite close to the forefront of most of our minds and i think yeah thinking about how much more inclusive we can be if we are hybrid or online only just for so so many different reasons it's so much easier for people and of course the there's the kind of the parallel opposite problem of uh, access to the internet which not everybody does have so yeah uh, i suppose i'm trying to tell you uh, something you already know which is that it's very complicated um but it sounds like we've all had really positive experiences of of being in online by plus spaces so I'm gonna I'm gonna open the floor to um, to anybody who wishes to speak on the topic of 
Can you tell us about any recent unexpected experiences in the online Biplus spaces, which might be positive, might be less so, um, but it's a, it's a caring, sharing space, so um, we'd love to hear about them. Who wants to start? I think, oh. I think I beat, you beat me. No, no, <laughs> Rebecca, you go first. You go <laughs> no, no, you go first. Um, I think one thing that I could talk about is uh, London by Pandas, which was a really great group that was around for a couple of years. But during the uh, pandemic, they took the decision to close down. And the reason why they took this decision is because the people who were running it, a couple of them were people of colour. And the thing that they were experiencing a lot of were that there were a few a few white bi people who are basically being a little bit fragile. And when for certain issues were coming up around people of colour and people of colour experiences, so often they would take a defensive approach instead sort of listening and learning from what the people of colour were saying. And what London by Pandas came out with is we don't have the energy to constantly moderate this and cater for white feelings and have to do this and that to moderate all of this. We're doing it outside of our jobs. It's a lot of work. Um, and it was very much talking about, well, if we want to break, like they were saying that they saw that a lot of people of color were sort of leaving the space. And if they wanted to, to dismantle whiteness, then they needed to dismantle their space because it was becoming a white space. And I think it's, that was really an interesting uh, case study and what sometimes can happen. I think we need to make sure that when we're talking about spaces, like we mentioned earlier, we talk about the intersectionality of spaces and we talk about making the space safe for people who belong to other marginalized demographics and making sure that they're listened to uh, rather than talked over or have to deal with people who are being defensive. Um, and I think we need to make sure that we are talking about other topics such as anti-racism, as well as when we're talking about biphobia and bi -erasia. Um, We're talking about ableism, we're talking about misogyny, we're talking about all of these other things at the same time and holding them to the same values. Yeah, interesting to hear. Like, I think as a bi person of color myself, like that's, uh, it's really important to be able to have those conversations and have those spaces. So as much as like, that's very sad that that organization in particular kind of had to close down for those reasons. Like, I hope that kind of discussion around those is becoming something that's more and more, more and more common. And like, I think, yeah, they made a, they made a sensible decision in that case to kind of moderate their space in that way. And that makes sense. That's really interesting. Um, does anyone else have any, any, uh, unexpected experiences they'd like to talk about. I think Rebecca had something she wanted to say. Yeah, so mine, mine's less about a kind of dedicated space, but um, something that surprised me uh, a bit was um, I recently had a civil partnership. Um, so I am with a, oh, pardon me, I'm with a, um, a cis man, uh, a cis straight man, and um, we decided that a civil partnership would be the, the route for us. So we waited until they were made legal, which was the 30th of June um, this year. And we uh, were the first couple in Fife to have one, which was really nice. Um, and I was, thank you. I was so surprised and unexpected because obviously it was in the media a little bit and I, I posted online about it. I got trolled so bad, like I didn't, realize how kind of deep people's misunderstanding about you know our community goes um and yeah that that was really surprising but I also had people reaching out to me and tell me they were in the same situation and now they're going to get a civil partnership because they think it suits them um so it was like a great and weird and bad experience kind of like all rolled into one um but of course they weren't dedicated uh, by plus spaces it was um you know facebook <laughs> the usual culprit um, and um newspapers online and um it wasn't too bad on twitter uh, but i also got a lot of lovely compliments on my black dress so that made me happy <laughs> your dress was stunning <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> well 
that's so lovely to hear that um you got a lot of positive comments and i'm really sorry about the 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 trolling um which is a shame um is there anything lorna wants to say on this topic um before we move on to our next question so we've already touched on this before but actually what surprised us was the number of non-scottish people that have attended our online events we assume there'd be some like people from england obviously that makes sense we have had people from all over the world and from countries where it's not as safe to be lgbt attending these events because there is no events in their own country and it has been unexpected i expected it to be basically the people we saw in person before the pandemic i didn't expect for the community to grow so much in lockdown um, and for so many people to want to find these spaces and especially our neurodiverse space we've realized a lot of the community is neurodiverse and i think we run the only neurodiverse bi plus group in possibly the world as far as we know, so we do have people showing up from all over the world because they want this space and it's been overwhelming, <laughs> like un completely unexpected um, and so lovely that we can provide a safe space for people who have multiple conflict sort of um, intersectional identities and, you know, the ableism, the biphobia, often the trans and non-binary phobia, all of it comes together and racism just and it all seems to intersect there and it's been lovely to provide a sort of safe non-judgmental space for people. It's good to hear that the Scottish Bypass Network is literally kind of world leading. That um, doesn't surprise me, but it's still great to hear. Um, and it's that's kind of a good springboard to move on to our last uh, question. Um, I noticed we do have a uh, we do have some questions from the audience, but now is a good time to get your thinking caps on and post them in our direction um, while our panelists answer the last question, which is a big one, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, so, as I think we've all experienced being online and being by plus online, you do kind of encounter a lot of affirmation and, uh, you know, as much as it can be a double edged sword, as, as Rebecca was talking a little bit about, there is lots of um, lovely things about about being online, but how do we move beyond kind of visibility, which is a funny thing to be asking on a by visibility day, but how do we move beyond it and to something more meaningful and useful for the bi plus community? How do we, yeah, what, what do we do next? Um, and uh, I'll ask, I'll ask Rebecca to start. Yeah, so I think um, just everything we've learned during the pandemic about how to make our community stronger just keep doing that as things start changing really push to ensure we're not just going back to how things were before and I think touching on what Vineet was saying as well making sure we're not making it all about white by people we've got to keep everything inclusive because um yeah it, it just doesn't work the way it used to and we need to just make those changes and learn from this pandemic um and as Vinny said, we don't need to applaud the pandemic <laughs> for obvious reasons. But yeah, I think it's created a lot of learning opportunities and it's a shame how those opportunities have come about. But just making sure we're pushing and keep pushing and keep being. I know we're moving beyond visibility, but um, yeah, keep organising, coming together and doing things like this and we'll get there. I feel like I was on the verge of going into an Instagram post then like uh, with a nice little picture in the background. And <laughs> Um, but yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to say, I mean, the reason why I made these t-shirts is so I made the hashtag and that was very like, very micro, very much like, oh yeah, affirmation, blah, blah, blah. But the reason why I made the t-shirt is because one, it's a great t-shirt for people to wear. But secondly, every five pounds on one of these t-shirts goes to a bisexual grassroots organization. Um, so you can get these from Rainbow and Co, like well plug. Um, there's also one for women and non-binary people. And so you can go and get those and it gives every single purchase gives five pounds to a bisexual organization. 
And I think that's really important because we are, I've spoken multiple times about the lack of funding. I know so many people who are posting their spreadsheets of the budget for the year and all of this stuff. So I think it's about uh, giving funding and donations. I think it's great to see people like Scottish Buy Network getting funding. It's great to see people like Buy Pride getting huge chunks of funding. It's really important. Um, but I think the really important thing is that we, when, when you look at stuff like online, especially when you look at stuff like Twitter, we get so wrapped up in arguments that are just a waste of our time and energy and breath. Like people are still bringing up buy versus pan. People are still bringing up who can say what slurs. It's just pointless. And I think we need to start focusing less on that and less giving less of our time to that and focusing on what stuff we actually need to talk about, such as the issues around healthcare, uh, mental health and, and sexual health. We need to be talking about the, the issues within the LGBTQ plus community, the lack of education, the lack of funding and resources, the burnout from activists. We need to start talking more and more about that and putting more and more of that information out there and I think we're doing it. I think the bike community is great at feeding out information, creating infographics and all sorts of stuff. There's tons and tons of work that they're doing. And I think we just need to keep pushing, like Rebecca said, just keep pushing this stuff um, and keep boosting it and platforming it. I think some of it is actually a lot of the deeper work is going on, but it's not seen as much, it's not as visible, it doesn't make a nice soundbite on Twitter. In fact, even the title of the research study is too long for Twitter. Um, so you have problems like that. And also, like we've pre pandemic, we did a lot of talking to the NHS about how to improve stuff for bi plus people. And they take all this information, but then you don't ever really hear back. So it's one of these constant things of about every six months, we're like, so this is still what we'd like, <laughs> um, and this is how you can improve, but we know these are very, very huge long-term changes. Um, we're part of the Scottish Parliament's LGBTI cross-party group. Um, we were the first bi group to speak about bi issues. In fact, we were the first group to speak about bi issues <laughs> at, at the Parliament. Um, and they were like, oh, we're really surprised we didn't know any of these statistics, even though they're very prominent statistics. And recently LGBT consortium did study into why bi groups don't typically get as much funding. And the outcomes from that are amazing. And I really hope they make the step and actually implement these things. And I think that's where the step comes because we obviously we can offer as much information and insight and research as they want, but often we're powerless or don't have, have very limited power to make them implement things. Um, but also it's a balancing act. The average person questioning whether they're bi or not, a little article about you are bi enough, that is often enough for them. Will that change the NHS? No. <laughs> and it's trying to sort of meet people at all the levels they're at. Um, so I think it has its place. As we said though, there is a lot of Discord on, um, on sort of social media where it almost feels in bad faith where people are picking apart the very tiny bits of our community rather than focusing on what we need, what needs to change and what we can do to support each other and uplift each other, especially, you know, white ally, allies supporting people of colour, cis allies supporting trans people and non-binary people. Um, I think it would be lovely if we could all focus on that a little bit more. Here about kind of a lot of the the activism work that that the Scottish Bi Plus Network is already doing, and like hopefully um, with more online visibility, kind of those things will be more easily accessible and more seen, and therefore kind of understood a little bit more. Um, so that was our last um, kind of planned question. Um, so if we can spend the last kind of ten minutes um, going through some of the the audience questions in the Q and A. Um, we have uh, one question already from Georgia. People would like to put uh, questions in in the meantime. 
So um, Georgia says, um, a friend of mine is an author and in her next book, she would like her main character to be bisexual to help advise a straight cis writer to write and represent bisexuality well and realistically. What would you want her to include or not include? I have my own ideas, but would like to hear from others in the community. Um, I would say um, in, in these cases, sensitivity readers are um, quite helpful. Obviously, the co concept is flawed in that one person can't give you the whole spectrum of experiences for bi plus people, but they can certainly um, hopefully advise on avoid, avoiding kind of biphobic tropes. Um, and you know by erasure um i mean for me obviously um erasing someone bisexual because they're with a uh, someone of a different gender um that always kind of irks me a bit um but obviously that's a very personal experience but um but yeah i think sensitivity readers um can be really useful for for stuff like this Yeah, I was going to say that I think it's really important to make sure that the bisexual is actually explicitly stated. I think a lot of the times when it doesn't, uh, people love to erase it. And, you know, I think you can still get something out of it anyway as a bisexual person reading it. If you, you will see bisexual. But I think so often the lack of vocabulary around bisexuality has been something that has impacted a lot of us. Like, we didn't know about the word and that made it hard to come out as that identity. So I think that's really important. Um, I definitely agree with sensitivity readers and trying not to fall on sort of old tropes. But just like Rebecca said, I think there's there's no single way to represent bisexuality. And, you know, even some of, some of those tropes is like, well, sometimes you do get by people who aren't exactly like morally upstanding citizens, right? There's no, there's no one way to be bisexual. Bisexual can be evil. Bisexual can be this and that. Um, but it's it's trying to make sure that it's not because they're bisexual and making sure that they're a multi, make them multifaceted, you know, we're, we're multifaceted beings. Don't make us some sort of 2D caricature of like, oh, they're bisexual, so of course they're evil. It's like, well, give them a little more source, you know, <laughs> give them a little more something than that. <laughs> That's going to be my advice for everything now. Give them a little bit more source. <laughs> Um, I think as well, um, as Vineet was saying, we want complex characters because we're complex people and that's how readers identify with any characters. So the same should always be extended to those with marginalised identities. Um, but I think while we're still building up that representation because we still don't have great bi plus representation in books, I think while we're still building that up, just avoiding the obvious tropes is, is good. So um, making them you know, sexually promis promiscuous is the, the phrase that people use. So kind of avoiding that or implying that because they're bisexual, they're therefore greedy or confused or they don't know what they want or they're going to just use uh, gay women and then, you know, go back to uh, men. So just kind of avoiding those things. Um, and sure, you'll get by people with all those things. Like, you know, as Vinny says, we're complex characters in our own way. Um, but yeah, just avoiding the harmful tropes that really just cause harm to the community because the more people read this, the more they believe it and then treat bi plus people accordingly um, because it's all that they know. So um, yeah, add more source. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with all of that for sure. I would say when in doubt, add more bi plus characters. like. It's a lot harder to stereotype when there's six of us. <laughs> I feel like that's just more realistic as well. I yeah. feel like when you have like a single bi person or gay person, a group of straight people, and I'm like, when was the last time I talked to a straight person? <laughs> right, and it's like, is that is that person okay? Do, do we need to find yeah, some friends? <laughs> like, I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I think, yeah, it's it's really about just making the character complex and really making them about more than just their identity. I feel like so often when it's about like a margin person from a marginalized identity, the whole story arc is about their marginalized identity. And I'm like, 
we can be other things. You could just make bisexual just like an offhanded comment and then like make a book about witches and they're all witches and that's great. <laughs> make a book where it's like a big fantasy, like Lord of the Rings-esque. They can be bisexual and they can sleep with this person or that person or whatever and they could say their sexuality, but it doesn't need to be the whole story, you know? It could just be one part of the like thing that gets mentioned. That's great. Thank you so much. And I hope George's friend appreciates all of the, the feedback. Um, we've got another question in the chat from Kathy. Um, and this is a this is a fun one. Um, so Kathy says, uh, we're all too familiar with the harmful tropes, um, but sometimes the lighter fun stereotypes are relatable. Do panelists have a favorite bi plus stereotype that they do relate to? I'm coming right in here with a checkered shirt. Love them. <laughs> Wish I wore it today, won't I? <laughs> I was going to follow that up with, I can never sit straight. I mean, I can't tell if you've seen how much I'm moving, but like, I just have this need to move my legs. <laughs> I'm a fan of cuffed jeans myself. That's, that's mine. I don't think I've ever worn a jean that hits my ankle in a very long time. <laughs> I was going to say once I was in like um, a circle of, of I was one of four people and we were all by and I like looked down at our ankles and was like look at this absolute state. <laughs> See I've never cuffed my jeans but I do cuff my shorts. I always cuff my shorts. My short shorts so good job. <laughs> um, I, I'm a personal fan of lemon bars when I can be bothered to make them lemon bars are are the one that is a very like reddit central stereotype i think <laughs> like if you ever go on the buy the buy reddit then it's all just look at all these lemon bars i made but um while we're on the on the topic of online spaces i do i do love a lemon bar they're delicious i think i can never have too many badges like i have a collection of pride badges and various like buy and pan colored badges and it's like is this too many? No, this is still not enough. <laughs> There's just always more nice ones out there, always. And then you have to like rearrange them all so that they all fit. <laughs> well, I think on that lovely note, that brings us to six o'clock, which is our scheduled end point. Um, so I would just like to say thank you so, so much to all of our panelists for um, making the effort to be here and for their lovely responses, their really insightful responses. Um, thank you to, to Kathy for a lot of the behind the scenes organization. Um, thank you to my uh, co-host, Sarah, um, and to uh, all of the Staff Pride Network folks behind the scenes. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, you to Zara. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. That's a good vibe the... online space. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just, yeah, I was just answering the question in the in the Q and A about uh, websites and stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, I quickly went in there because I wasn't sure how long we had so I was like yeah. check out Monstrous Regiment's books <laughs> <laughs> and also just like follow us all online and you'll find information and stuff uh, I am Nintendo Mad 888 in all your lovely socials that you could think of um yeah follow Scottish Buy Network Scottish follow Haunt Publishing and Rebecca follow all of us and you will uh, you will find buy stuff don't worry Fabulous. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and um, we have a feedback form. So um, if you've attended the event, if you've enjoyed the event, if you have any, um, any feedback for us, then uh, please let us know. Um, and we'll email that round to everyone as well. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thanks very much.